delighted to be here. Uh, I must uh, confess that um, uh, the uh, previous speaker, uh, President Sidi, you threw me off my game. I was going to do a talk, now I have to refer to my notes because I was so listening to you and I'm really off script. So I <laughs> so really appreciate the talk. Uh, and also, uh, Dean Hubert, thank you very much for also sharing the story of your dad. I think the message is it's never too late uh, to, to get started. So really thank you for that. Uh, for the organizers of uh, the, uh, the Africa Business Conference, really uh, delighted to have me here. Uh, the our company's ties to the Fukua community uh, is pretty deep. Uh, through the uh, innovations in healthcare uh, and the social enterprise at Duke, we were fortunate to, be, uh, to go through a three-year acceleration program here, which allowed us to develop our business model and our scaling plan. And I've also had the benefit of hosting, I believe, three students from the School of Business or from the School of Policy in our company uh, for extended periods of time. And we've had also um, benefited from the consulting groups that, that are here. So um, I'll be referring to my notes just so that I stay on script because the topic that I'll be uh, addressing, uh, which is Afropreneurship Unleashed is, is one that is near and dear, but I, there are some key points that I, I want to make sure uh, I, I captured. The, um, you know, it's a personal story that I'm going to be talking about because disruption uh, starts with self. And the message here is for everybody. It's probably also more uh, targeted at persons thinking about making the transition from employment to entrepreneurship in Africa. Uh, whatever I say and how I say it, forgive me, but it applies to most startups. But the issues that I raise should be pertinent to those thinking about starting up a business in Africa. So perhaps you might ask me out of the gate, what does Afropreneurship mean? Afropreneurship to me is a tale, a tale of two extremes. One where Afropreneurship is a noun, oops, sorry, is a noun, and as a noun, it exudes the desires of the diaspora executives or entrepreneurs who are comfortable being African in the workplace or during business dealings. They express it through their hair, their dress, their food, their accents, it's okay. And this could be anywhere in the world, for that matter. These are folks who are suffering from the African fever. And I think some of you may know the person in the picture here, Buzoma St. John, who was the head of branding at Uber. She did not dissociate her African identity from her role at Uber as a head of branding. It actually propelled the Uber brand into new markets, and that is the power of Afropreneurship. She was comfortable in her Africanness with all its legitimacy. Afropreneurship, on the other side, could be a scary word if looked at, looked at as a verb. As a verb, it's practitioners or a practitioner of the Africa rising philosophy with a vested interest in the economic activities on the ground against the odds of making it. Building and growing a business in Africa is tough for a variety of reasons which we could talk about. So these are folks, used as a verb, these are folks who have made the leap and are actually building businesses on the ground. I believe we are here because we believe in the Africa rising narrative and want to unleash our talent in that regard. And if so be the case, you're all most welcome. And I am absolutely delighted to have been invited to share my story 
because I'm switched on, I'm so switched on in building businesses in Africa, and I hope that some of my passion rubs off during my talk. From the uh, brightness of the boardrooms in Nairobi, Harare, and Kigali, to the hustle and bustle of the streets of Lagos, Kampala, and Accra, hope and despair preoccupy the waking moments of millions of people, traders, smallholder farmers, bankers, technology experts, of all shades and capital orientation, shaping the African narrative, chipping at the African rising story. These are the, these are the entrepreneurs that we are celebrating today. My hope is that you might just feel a little bit more energized to become one. With the hype and reality of the billions of transactions that happen every day on mobile money, against the backdrop of over 50% 50, 50 of homes not having a bank account, where people every day are building wealth through table banking, The light shines on Africa as a rising market. Fueled by the dreams of people planting macadamia nuts, moringa, raising chickens and goats for export to foreign markets, and equally fueled by the dreams of many who are seeking contracts with government, be it to in the oil industry, in the infrastructure industry. The moment to get into the African market is now. Africa is indeed open for business. As you can see in this uh, illustration here, the Africa rising story is not new. It's now almost half a century old. But the footnotes back in the early 90s during the Clinton administration was Africa rising, birth, you know, despair, war, poverty. Then it shifted to Africa rising, birth. Maybe we're not sure if it's true. To Africa indeed rising. And now we're not talking about Africa rising, we're talking about nations rising. If you look at Rwanda, the sponsor adverts for the Premier League, where it says Rwanda open for business. Forbes magazine, Zimbabwe open for business. And Forbes even has its headquarters now in Kigali. Even CNN has one reporter for the whole of Africa. Still, but Forbes has invested. So the narrative is no longer if. It's just a matter of how fast. So, excuse me. Uh, so the gazelles, uh, sharks, goliaths flocking to the African market is the third wave. And I want to emphasize the moment and the urgency. It's the third wave. The first wave was when the world was discovering Africa, discovering quote unquote. It was about land. It was about coming to give a sense of national identity, education, and religion. Every anthropologist would say, Africa got the short end of the stick. The second wave was when there was a, there was a rush for natural, natural resources in exchange for aid and loans. Everyone, all economists would agree, Africa got the short end of the stick. The third wave, which we talk about, is a rush for access to a new market, driven by the rising middle class. And this month's economist says, this time around, Africans, the African market would benefit. This is one that is based on foreign direct investments and impact funds for the most part. 
And most of the African Union presidents are solely rallied behind trade, not aid. Capital markets are aware. Embassies are opening. This year alone, over 200 embassies have opened around the world. You may not hear it on CNN, but almost all the countries in the Middle East are reopening their embassies in the Africa market. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, you name it, India, opened 18 embassies within the last three months in different African nations. Trade deals are happening in Nairobi, the railroad track. The, the president of France was there now talking about the um, fast railroad for downtown Nairobi. Skyscrapers are rising. Where I live in Nairobi, in 2010, there was barely any tall buildings. I'm surrounded now by tall buildings. Headquarters are moving and are opening. The best executives are being sent to the Africa offices. Make no mistake, every serious business knows that they need Africa in their portfolio. Your banker and your supplier may be speaking to you in Chinese. Your main distributor may be speaking to you in Arabic. Your competitor in English with an American accent. The game is truly global with a high potential for Africa to benefit from it. However, in as much as the charm and allure of the Silicon Savannah is real, as we await the emergence of the first African unicorn, there is an ugly reality. As you consider someday pursuing the VC-backed growth opportunities in the African market, you have to be ready to fight hard, hard and harder than you've ever fought in a job in corporate America to break the glass ceiling. And the question is that as you're thinking about making that shift, are you ready to make it to the top? Do you have what it takes? Are you sure you can do it? And I'm sure you are, but a word of caution, as we say in Sheng, come slow. Come slow, because it is rough out there. Now, when this picture broke out on Facebook, it was very alarming for those of us who are African entrepreneurs working in the market. This was the image of the leading tech startups in Kenya. As you can imagine, many of us were like, where am I? I built a company, I have 34 staff, now valued at over $5 million. Why am I not on the list? Damn it. I'm not on the Facebook Hall of Fame of social entrepreneurs in Africa. How is that possible? Some might ask, are African-born entrepreneurs involved? Are the cheaters, that means those who have vast experience working for Fortune 500s, some of you sitting in this room, are you engaged? Are you aspiring business professionals ready? Or are you on a leech, or are you unleashed to get into the African market? Are you switched off, or are you switched on? Allow me to go rogue for a minute here. As we talk about Afropreneurship, it is sort of masked in the reality of Afrofuturism. There's a hype. It is not only about the fashion industry. Top designers are breaking new uh, ground, putting amazing designs out there, and it's happening. It's not about the music industry. We all know that right now, the Nigerian music is just dominating the whole continent and the world. And you have now partnerships between Janet Jackson, Beyonce, and African musicians like never before. It is not about Nollywood or Chimamanda Adichie's latest novel or Lupita's new iconic look. That's not what it is about in entirety. Yes, Wakanda forever, but it's about the hopes and aspirations of Africa's entrepreneurs solving the wicked development challenges in Africa. Education gaps. We still have many areas where kids do not have electricity in their classrooms 
or proper classrooms that is not environmentally safe. The health gaps. Many people still don't have access to medicines, and I'll talk about that in my business. Water sanitation. As the skyscrapers are rising, water shortage is happening in Nairobi, Lagos, Accra, Lomé. Women and girls, it is not imaginable that with all the innovation, we had the Chimbok story. Couldn't we have done something to prevent that? Energy and environment, the list is long. So I struggle with the narrative of Africa rising when the masses of Africans' young talent are hurdled away from the audacity of entrepreneurship on the continent, quote unquote, and settled for jobs that rob them of the, all their creativity, the want of fulfillment, and in many cases, they opt for drudgery. I can't fathom being beat on the home turf in the face of these big developmental challenges that affect our families and our people. Let me be clear, I'm not an advocate of exclusion. I only wonder if we are hungry enough for a bigger slice of the pie that is baking at home. That is, are you hungry for entrepreneurship, the verb? It's okay to be the noun, but the verb. I'm in the thick of it, and I'm constantly haunted by the voices of fear and despair. People asking me, why did you go back home? Are you running an NGO? Because the perception is you can only run development enterprises in the market. How do you make money? Do you have a 401k plan? These are people asking you to your face those questions. I have out of empathy for the fact that you are trying to set up a business in Africa. Complaints about the roads, the traffic, the bribes. Afropreneurship is a scary proposition. I'm scared too. I continue to wonder, shall I make Omar? And the jury's out. But here's my story. It's a story, yes, of looking for the dollar. It's a story of unleashing my talent, but it is also a story of seeking a sense of identity. In 2001, I had earned my PhD from the University of Rochester and was hired by Kodak. Immediately got to the um, position as a senior scientist. That was in the heyday of diversity and inclusion in the Fortune 500 companies. So within six months, I was put on an executive track. By the end of the nine months, I was promoted. I became head of toxicology labs. I had 24 employees, a budget of $3 million, and I was 24, 25 years old. That was what success was like. As you can imagine, as any professional urged or feeling the need to express themselves as actualized, the need to identify themselves as self-actualized, I bought a house and bought a swanky Crossfire. If you know what a Crossfire is, it's the first car that was produced by Demler and Chrysler. Sports with some wings that come out when you're driving. Red hot. And I drove it to work. And one of my good friends, the boss, said, hey, Mocha, it's a guy whom I respected, he said, don't bring this car to work. You're sending the wrong message. The message is that you're earning too much. I'd suggest you keep it at home. I thought about it. He was right. So I bought a 12-year-old Buick called a Cream Puffer for $2,800 on my credit card, and that was what I was driving to work. But that was a remarkable moment where for the first time I had a dual identity, the real me and my identity in the corporate space. Long story short, I had a very successful career at Kodak and was later promoted to head the health benefits department. We had 65,000 employees. And it was also at the time Kodak was downsizing massively because of the losing business. Tired of the repeated downsizing, I decided to look for greener pastures and was employed by Blue Cross and Blue Shield as the director of utilization management in charge of 2.2 million lives. Got to excel as Blue Cross and Blue Shield, nice title, 
no staff, no budget, sitting in meetings, planning to plan to plan for events I had no control of, and I had no say. My sense of identity was again crushed. And I said, well, I can choose to uh, keep here, keep on working here, or I should think about another career. That was quite an experience. Now, uh, I decided, you know, I'm going to jump ship. And I interviewed for a position as head of Africa office for a micro insurance firm. Consultants from around the world interviewed me. I was the finalist. I was flown to London, interviewed, spent a whole day with the CEO, came back to the US. And after a week, the CEO called me and said, we love you, but unfortunately, you can't get the job. You don't have Africa experience. Now, having grown in Cameroon, <laughs> that didn't make sense to me. Needless to say, that was denying me of my African identity, and that was a no-no. So I was at a crossroads as a successful young professional to say, what do I want to do? Well, like every good person whose ego is shaken by corporate America, I opted for more training. The notion of getting an MBA was the only logical move. I still had aspirations of climbing the corporate ladder to the rank of CEO. The identity crisis was crushing me on a daily basis. The assumption was there is a formula that you can follow. You just got to get the formula right. And if you follow the formula, you will be great. The system, however, is based on conformity, compliance, and standardization. So you always have to measure how much am I willing to give in for a new identity, or do I be myself? The notion of an entrepreneurship was Put into, put into, called into question at that very given moment. However, I must recognize that people are diverse, creative, and we all want fulfillment, not drudgery. I had the choice to either conform or to reform. I was reminded by the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, saying greatness is achieved by nonconformity. My mother is a psychologist, so we used to hear this stuff all the time. So I kind of said, well, I think uh, the corporate America story is not reassuring. I had to make a choice to build a whole new relationship network in America to make the next move. Because to move up to the, co the position of vice president in the corporation, I had to know people at the state level I had to know people, the executives in the local hospitals, the lobbying groups. That kind of relationship would require me having a very different identity than I was willing to have. So I had to break the mold. I chose for reform, and it required enormous creativity. I knew I was creative. I had sufficient experience from my previous roles to hack it on my own. I knew I was an entrepreneur at heart. There's a recent uh, documentary called In Search of Greatness. And Sir Ken Robinson, also known to uh, have written books that question whether schools kill creativity, said, when it comes to leadership and entrepreneurship, and this pressure of conformity, all inventive and creative people, they are not just hung up on fixed definitions of what any form of life or reality may be. They create. In reality, I had no fixed definition of what reality was at that point. I had taken a loan to go to school. So I got into Harvard on July, in July 2011 to study healthcare management. I successfully made it into an elite program and I was the first African foreign trained graduate to get into this program that was purposefully designed to train executives to drive the healthcare sector in the United States. One of 25 slots every year. 
So I kind of had a different sense of calling in that whole dynamic. I said, well, if I'm sitting here amongst the best in the US, is my role to continue to contribute to the US or to the Africa equation? So I'd sit in class and my head was spinning because all the case studies we're doing were about the US market. But then one afternoon I heard a new story about NPR, on NPR. And the story was about most African states being behind on the Millennium Development Goals. And that in actuality, the maternal mortality rates in many countries were getting worse. I took a piece of paper, I wrote down, I am going to be doing my next career in Africa. That was a turning moment. I submitted my proposal for my capstone project and was to turn around a small clinic in a village in Africa. When I presented it, you had my counterparts in the same class, chief medical officer and chief operating officer of Dana Faber Cancer Institute. Chief medical officer, chief operating officer of the university, university hospital at Rice. Mo Kalantum, his project is <laughs> to go operate a small clinic in Kenya. People thought I was crazy. I packed my bags, I didn't know so, moved into Kenya, and then started understanding what the market could, could do. And that was the beginning of my story as an entrepreneur. I founded my first company, uh, Sagita uh, MicroClinic Technologies, which has recently rebranded into uh, Sagittarix. Now, when I got to that hospital, as I was one morning at 8 o'clock in the morning, there was a baby, a young mother, about 16 years old, who came with her baby, her husband, and the grandmother. The baby was having a fever and severe pneumonia and a meningitis. The mother was very distraught. I prescribed a strong, what's called a, a um, cephalosporin, that is a very strong antibiotic. It wasn't in the public dispensary. The baby, the mother, we, so we advised the mother to go 15 kilometers down the road. The medicine was not there. She was sent from there to the district hospital 30 kilometers down the road. The medicine was not there, and she was sent to the provincial hospital in Kisumu, for those who know Kenya. Finally, the mother found the medicine at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and it was $40 for the dose. She didn't have the money. She had to come all the way back to the village and then take money and go back to the hospital. The baby received the treatment at 8 p.m. Fortunately, the baby survived, but at that moment, I kind of realized the challenge I had to deal with as an entrepreneur. What was the role of technology in healthcare was the question I asked. And so our first product was to build an ecosystem whereby using a mobile application, anywhere any public nurse could see the price of medicines, could identify the location, and send the patient directly to go get medicines. That built our first product, ZD, which scaled to 60 hospitals, we're in four countries, but it also informed the next growth of phase, the next growth phase for our for our, for our, our, our solution. I realized that technology won't cut it alone, in part because deploying technology has many challenges. So we got into the medicine distribution business and started distributing medicines. We now distribute medicines to over 40 companies. We're in over four townships in Kenya, and last year alone distributed medicines to over 20,000 uh, households. We serve the elderly, we serve persons with chronic disease, diseases, we serve women who need rapid diagnostic services. And last year, we expanded our business to the Checkups brand, where we are now offering rapid diagnostic services to women and the elderly in rural areas. And in the Nairobi market, we're offering our services as a managed care services for companies to help them control their cost of medicines. So we have scaled in a very non-traditional way, and we're proud of that. We have partners, Huawei, GSK, Sanofi, Medtronic, uh, funded our work last year, and we're able to achieve this growth with cash flow, grants, and very little debt. And 
It's a remarkable story which says you do not need to wait for equity to grow your company. Uh, this year we signed an exclusive partnership with Sanofi and we're launching the first East Africa patient support program for diabetes patients. And our first checkup site was launched by the president of Sanofi Africa. So, as I close, I'd like to kind of share with you what I think about as key principles for success as an Afropreneur. The first is fight for your sense of identity or nurture your sense of identity and family values. I think the first speaker clearly articulated what that means to him. But really, at its core, it's about nurturing the relationships that will make your business successful. That is something that I see a lot of those who are on the list of successful startup funding that are able to do better than many of us. You have to figure out how to nurture relationships. Call your father's friends. Call your mother's friends. Those are the folks who give you your first deal. All my first contracts were based on the two or three people who sat around me in Harvard. They knew somebody who knew somebody and they referred them to me. Your impact strategy must be clear. As you shape your identity, don't run away from the challenges. If I ran away from that baby that day, I would not have a company today. That baby's challenge shaped my vision. At the darkest of the times when I didn't know what I was going to do, I just knew I wanted to work in the African market. Clifford is the reason why I have my company. Do not run away from the impact opportunity. As you shape your identity and nurture your identity, I would strongly suggest to secure tangible assets. And the most important tangible asset you can get is if you have a family friend or member or parent, start your business from the home. Don't be bought into the notion of getting an executive office downtown. It eats into your working capital very quickly, much faster than you can ever think of. It's not a bad idea to start your business from a home and even use your parents' car to run the first couple of months while you're operating your business. Secondly, decide on being a manufacturer or a financer. There are two ways in which you create value in the business. Either you're producing the goods or you're distributing the goods and you're paying for the distribution in the supply chain and thereby acquiring new customers to create a market. Many uh, 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 folks who start businesses in Africa kind of miss that fundamental aspect of the fact that you either have the talent to make something new or you should have the financial muscle to scale. And that is why a lot of software technologies do not scale. They don't have the financial muscle to scale their technologies. And so it's, most mobile apps are financial strategies more than technology strategies. In the process of doing that, you know, it's important to identify your customer base in each market that will enable you to maximize the value that you're creating. And you should always have the intention of ultimately controlling your supply chain. That means if you have any chance, become the manufacturer and the distributor and the financier if you can. That seems to be what succeeds. The third is ask for money at the right time. I'll keep it short and sweet. Many people have an idea and they start going after VC money. That is absolute folly. The other mistake that people make at this time, even though they are not trading money, they are already trading the equity of their companies. They go into 50-50 partnerships. That is the worst thing you could ever do. If you're a good business person, Try for 51, 49. But if I'm you, I'll start at 100% because if you succeed, you'll be diluted. The notion of priority ownership is simply folly. Next thing is capitalize your balance sheet right out of the gate. Get an asset that you can leverage because sooner or later, once you run out of your startup funds, you need to go to debt. You need collateral. So the soonest you can get some asset, a car, Something that the bank can hold, the more likely you are to succeed. Many entrepreneurs cannot walk into a bank, especially tech entrepreneurs, 
because they have zero collateral to put up against, even $5,000 of loan. Number four, the mindset shift. No one owes you a penny. You have to fight for it. There was a tagline in our business class at, um, at Harvard. It says, the mindset of the executive is, if you got some, I lost some, my goal is to take it back. And that is your number one job. Be street smart with integrity. By street smart, I'll give an example very quickly. One of the things I learned is that if you're going to tender for a document, you meet the procurement officer, he might ask you, what's the price for your product? Think about it, he's asking your competition. He may be leaking out that information. So one of the best ways is to say, hey, I'm going to give you $5 per piece. In the tender document, you quote at $4.25. That's how you win deals. So you street smart with integrity. Also make sure that the market talks about you because people refer businesses to you. There is, regardless of the marketing out there, the only way you hear about deals is when people say, hey, Mocha, there is this thing happening in the back. The last piece is core competencies. There are certain things you have to train yourself to be very good at. It's like mixed martial arts. You need to know how to punch, how to do a takedown, how to do a bare naked choke. Those are, that's what it takes to fight in the hexagon. The African market is like the hexagon. And apologies for the um, fact that the slide is cut out. But you have to be good at proposal writing. Be your editor in chief. You have to be good at procurement and contracting. Be your own lawyer and your accountant. I'm very good friends with the founder of CVS. He told me this, his father's story. His father would have two contracts at all times with two briefcases when he went to sign a contract. If he was not comfortable with the final conversations, he would either do one of two things. He would create a force, rip the contract, or he would walk away out of the meeting, leaving one briefcase behind, and he's gone. And then people would call him, oh, Mr. Kona, what happened to you? You left your briefcase. He's like, think about it and call me back. He threw the ball right back on their backs. Those kinds of tactics could save you a lot of money, because in many cases, you can't afford a good lawyer. Be street smart. Lastly, make sure that your values are represented in your brand, because that is really what's going to make you unique, and no one can take that away from you. So entrepreneurship may sound militaristic, but remember, it is also a style, and it's also an art, and you must be purposeful. Hence the importance of entrepreneurship the noun. Your style is what sells. So I would say go with what you got into the hexagon, there's only now, now there is, there ever was, now there ever shall be. Que sera, sera. The future is not ours to see, but Africa will be kind on you. Make the leap of, take the leap of faith and join us on the ground. Thank you.